just gonna throw it over to the one and only Abigail Dankwa, um, who will be talking to you today. And she's a fixed rig and multi-camera director. Um, we're gonna find out a little bit more about how she became a director, the different types of camera directing that she does and how you get an idea onto TV um, and get into TV. Um, Abigail's put together some resources and a little slideshow, which we'll get to um, a little bit later, but you'll have the opportunity to also ask questions. So like I said earlier, just throw them in the chat. Alrighty, Abigail. Are you ready? I'm ready for, yeah, I'm ready for my close-up. Come on, let's do this. Let's go. <laughs> um, Hello, lovely people. Glad you're here. Thanks for joining. So yeah, ask away. Ask me some questions. Wicked. So first things first, um, mm -hmm. tell me about your start in TV. So there's kind of two different starts in TV, but I'll, I'll do sort of the most recent that brought me to what I'm doing now. Um, so I'm a multi-camera fixed rig TV director. And I started um, directing in about 2015. Um, and I started on a show called Big Brother, which I'm sure most of you will have known. Uh, I did fixed rig directing, and that basically meant that I followed the crazy housemates in the house. Uh, so it was my job to tell a story of whatever they were doing in the house with other directors and I'll explain further on how we kind of direct those kind of shows. But that was my first um, show that I directed. Amazing. Um, and you haven't always been in TV. I know your career changed um, at some point. What did you do pre-film school? So yeah, so I went, I did Big Brother in 2015 and that came off the back of going to film school in 2010. So I went to the National Film and Television School, did an MA in producing and directing television and entertainment for two years, um, which was great. But prior to that, um, as I said, I did have other careers. So directly prior to that, I worked in television, but on broadcast management. So for a small digital TV channel, I started in acquisitions, I actually started doing work experience because I worked before that in fashion. I'll, I'll, I'll start actually, I'll start with fashion. So I used to be um, a model agent and photographer's agent. So I worked in the fashion industry for seven years and my job was to find work for my models or my photographers. Great experience, loved it, but I got to a point where I realized I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. I'd always wanted to get into television from a very young age. I wanted to be, well, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I did a GCSE in media studies and I thought TV was glamorous. I saw all those people on TV and I thought, I want to be like that. Unbelievable to me, now I know it's, it ain't that glamorous, <laughs> but it's still good fun. Um, so yeah, I came out of fashion, didn't know anybody in the television division industry. Really one of my friends was, um, asked to host a show they wanted a kind of non TV person and so I went to support her and went to this digital digital channel um, and just found out about it and ended up doing work experience there uh, I stayed at that channel for I did work experience for three months then got a job there which was supposed to last me three months um, doing acquisitions so that's where you buy the content that goes onto the shows so like if you watch BBC and you see uh, an American series, I don't know, whatever, uh, uh, Breaking Bad, for instance, BBC haven't made Breaking Bad. They've acquired it from another production company or, or a broadcaster. That was my job on a very small scale, getting content in. I stayed there for five years. I got promoted to acquisitions producer, head of acquisitions. And the last year and a half, I ran the channel, which wasn't the plan. <laughs> Um, I thought I was going to be there for a little while and go off and produce stuff, but I just, I got used to it and I enjoyed it. They were paying me. So, you know, it was great. And then I realized that I really wanted to try and really crack being, I thought by then a producer. So that's where I sort of segued into going to film school and doing my MA. And the idea was that when I graduated, I'd work towards becoming an entertainment producer. Um, and that was the whole plan. And then I sat in the director's chair while we were directing, because there was the course was producing and directing. So I thought the producing staff, that's what I'm here for. 
directing stuff, not really interested, but I've got to do it, so I'll, you know, I'll turn up, whatever. Sat in the director's chair and went, oh, I like this. <laughs> this is fun. The power. Um, yeah, so I ended up just, yeah, decided sort of quite early on in the course, it was two years, to just change and, and do directing and fix on um, entertainment directing in particular. But weirdly though, although I'm trained as a, I was originally trained as a multi-camera director, and I'll explain all of it later on, the first directing, as I said, was on Big Brother. And that directing was not taught at film school. I had to learn on the job. And that was scary as hell. Jeez. Um, and so from like film school to where you are today, what did that process look like? Um, and can you tell us a little bit about when you graduated? Okay, so I graduated in 2012. The course was two years long. Um, and during that course, I made it my business to do lots of extra curricular activities. Um, and so I did a lot of work experience. I, um, we did, we went to part of a course. They don't do it anymore. I don't know why, but I'm really grateful they did it when I did it. Um, we went to um, the Rose Door, which is like the BAFTA for Europe. We went, which was in Switzerland. So we helped set the Rose Door up for that year, me and my, four, my five other um, classmates. We helped them do the production. It was a massive thing. Uh, and then the last two days of that 10 day period, they gear up to record the award ceremony for, for the Rose Door. So if you imagine BAFTAs, but for Europe, okay? So there's a massive auditorium. People have flown in from different countries. They've got their nominations for the different, um, different uh, shows. And my job then was to be the assistant to the director of this. So I'm still a, I'm still a student. I'm a mature student, but I'm still a student, still learning. So my job was, as we did rehearsals, was to write down the notes and even different sequences if things went wrong. I wrote the notes and my job was to tell the director so that he would then go and give the address to all the crew and cast so they knew what was um, the next thing to do. And that's why the next rehearsal, what the right thing to do was. So I would write everything down. And I remember on one rehearsal, we were working in the gods, so the very highest part of the auditorium. And we used to walk down, I don't know how many flights of stairs, to the stage where he would go on the stage and do this address and tell them what they got wrong. And one instance, we were coming down, I was going through all the notes saying like sequence two, sound needs to come up quicker, all this sort of stuff. And at one point he kind of stopped me and said, Abigail, we need to stop. And I'm like, yeah, but I haven't finished. He went, yeah, but we're about to walk into the men's loo. And cause I was so in my head into it, I was so in it. I completely didn't see anything. I was so, and I, I think that was one of the first parts that made me think, I love this job. Mm. So cut to a couple of, you know, the following year, I ended up working as a, um, his assistant. He came to, to do um, the Champions League final opening ceremonies. I was his assistant on that. I met a woman on there who was a stage manager who was doing a little job. She told me she wanted me to work on it. And that was later on in the year. That little job turned out to be one of the stage managers on the auditions for the opening closing ceremonies of the Olympics and Paralympics. Um, off the back of that, I got interviewed to do the, the actual Olympics. And I thought this is where they say, Abigail, we really like you, but we need the proper stage managers now. So we're just doing this because we have to. Um, so I went in there, we had a cup of tea. They were like, how did it go? I'm like, it's great, I really enjoy it. And then um, uh, a week later, I got a uh, letter saying, oh yeah, we would love you to be one of the stage managers. So on the opening and closing ceremonies of Olympics and the Paralympics, I was one of 50 people and I was the only one who had no prior experience. And that was a baptism of fire. And off the back of that, I did lots of floor managing on various shows. Um, I assisted directed on some Sky comedy shorts. And then all that kind of led up to doing Big Brother in 2015. Can you tell us a little bit about 24 hours in A&E as well? Yeah, so 24 mm -hmm. hours in A&E, I did that the following year after doing Big Brother. So that would have been uh, 2016. And it's a very different type of directing. So because mm -hmm. the way you direct on Big Brother, in the gallery, there are two directors sitting side by side. And I'll show you pictures later of the gallery. 
and you're looking at the screen. So in Big Brother, there's probably about 70, 80 screens. There's the hot head, um, hot head cameras that are fixed into the location. And in the gallery, for each of those hot head cameras, there's a, mo a respective monitor, and that's what I'm looking at. And because it's so crazy in Big Brother, um, things can be happening in the kitchen and something else can be happening in the bathroom. So to cover that as best as possible, you have two directors. So I might be in the garden looking at the craziness that's happening there. The director sitting next to me is looking at the craziness that's happening in the bathroom. If they run into various rooms, we then have to discuss between us who's, the, who's, the, who's taking precedent and who's back up. Mm. I'll, it's hard to possibly get your head around now. When we get to it, I'll show you the actual pictures and it will explain it better um, because it's very involved. And Big Brother is, you know, most of it is just the, the stuff you see is all the craziness. They're running from place to place. It's like you're cutting really quickly um and it's just it's it's frantic yeah i remember you telling me that story of um a screen changing like automatically like, looking like a, out of a horror film and then yeah. just like trying to like live direct that and jeez yeah so you're, you're live directing and you're live editing even though it all goes in so you sit on a shift and it's eight hours long mm. that will all go into the edit whatever i've shot so i could be there for eight hours covering, I don't know, six or seven different stories and two minutes will turn up on air. Wow. Um, just, that's just the nature. And so what I'm doing as a director in those situations is that I'm doing a live line cut, I'm doing a, a live edit or a line cut. Um, and all that footage that is, is cut up goes to the edit and the editor will then, with a story producer or edit producer, they will formulate the show based on what I've cut and what the other directors cut. Same thing happens in 24 Hours in A&E. Mm. Two directors are on shift, but they're not together. They have their own sort of rooms within the quarter cabin. There's, I, I switch between major and minor galleries. So there's two galleries. The minor gallery is where if you can walk into A&E, you're covered by that gallery. And it's, for, you know, so if you broke your leg, you've, got, you've cut your hands, You've got a son or daughter who's come through with um, paediatrics. When you watch 24 Hours in Annie, it's where the, the, the funny stuff happens, the reception area stuff happens, the people in, behind the reception, the, um, the paediatric stuff. That's all covered by the miners gallery. If you are unfortunate, or fortunate, because you know, they NHS do a brilliant job, to come through via LAS, which is the London Ambulance Service, or through um, uh, HEMS, which is the helicopter, you're covered in the majors gallery. And that's because it's for sort of major incidents. That gallery runs 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day whereas the miners gallery roughly runs about, I think it's about 16 hours. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we're working simultaneously, but we've got our own sections of the A&E department to look at. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, both like fixed rig directing and multi-camera directing. Yeah. Could you, I guess, break down what those two different styles are of direction yeah. and like the genres that they fall into? Yes, I can. And this is where I need to share screen, if that's okay. Uh, and I, and so what I'm going to do actually, I'm going to talk about, just so everyone's on the same page, single camera, multi-camera and fixed rig camera directing. Hopefully you'll be able to see everything. So this is mm -hmm. different types, okay? So I'll do very quickly run through this. This slide I can send you. So if you can't see anything, don't worry about it. I'm gonna send this, this to Amber and they'll send them out. But basically it's just talking about the different types of directing. Single camera directing, roughly used in drama, documentary, usually, and used to, it's changing slightly, but used to just use one camera and that was the camera that took, you know, that filmed all the action. And they would shoot the same scene probably two or three different times to get a close up, to get a mid shot and to get a wide shot, essentially. Um, 
and the kind of shows that that would be in or films would be things like Black Panther, Tiger King, you know, Emma Willis delivering babies, news interviews on location and pieces of camera. When you think of a piece of camera, I'm sure you all kind of know that's where the camera literally is that you see me now and someone's just talking to camera. That's a piece of camera. With multi-camera, the genres are basically entertainment, shiny full shows. They're called shiny full shows because back in the day, and they still are, the floor was actually shiny, as <laughs> simple as that. So they're the big shows that you think of, Street to Come Dancing, you know, um, X Factor, uh, entertainment shows, panel game shows, quiz shows like The Last Leg, and also in sports, um, you know, so Champions League Final, for instance. And I'll show you the types of cameras that we use as well later. Fixed rig is a relatively new phenomenon, probably used within the started round about the last 10 or no, probably about 20 years now because of Big Brother. Um, yes, yeah, so it's usually used in sort of entertainment, documentary, factual and reality. So these are the hot head cameras that I mentioned before. So they're cameras that are fixed into an area in a sort of they call it, it's a very telly word, a precinct. And it basically means an institution, a school, a police station, a hospital, or a home. So you've got these cameras fixed into their location in a rig. And that's where the term fixed rig comes from. Shows that you see that on 24 hours in A&E, Love Island, Love is Blind on Netflix. I don't know if you ever saw that. That's when they were in those rooms. Uh, crazy show. Big Brother in fact is a hybrid because it uses cameras that you would have in multi-camera situations so the ped cameras which I'll show you pictures of later and also the hotheads so when you're filming Big Brother we have both of those types of cameras in use or available for the director. From the conversations we've had and like the mentoring every time we've sort of met you've always like reinforced the importance of knowledge and of like learning about the industry and like the specificities of the things that you want to go into um and the people doing those things um and researching and it's just really clear to see through that presentation as well like the importance of knowing what you're getting into when you go into this industry and also the different varieties of things that are available for you to do as a director um really quickly um, and if anyone else has questions as well feel free to dash them in the chat but I just wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit about Wonderball and what you did on that show. Wonderball is uh, I'm not sure how much time we're gonna have because I'm gonna be really quick um, so Wonderball yeah. was basically um, it was kind of like the first multi-camera directing show that I did but I had a supervising director we did 30 episodes he did the first two and I basically watched him, shadowed him to make sure that I knew exactly what I was doing. But then he went and I was left to do the 28. And that was always going to happen. I was going to do the 28 other episodes. Um, we did those in five days, which is unheard of. So the first day we did, I shot five. I think the next four days I did six. Usually you only shoot four episodes in a day. So it was crazy. Um, it was done for BBC Scotland with a, a production company called Mighty Productions, who were really lovely. JD, the floor manager, he was like that. He was my floor manager. He was brilliant. Um, he's been in the industry like 20 odd years. And he was like, when, I, when, we first, when we got to the end, he was like, Abigail, I have been doing this for years and we have, I have never shot five episodes in a day, let alone six. I have no idea how you did it. I had no choice. I didn't know any difference. Oh, well, fire. Well, I don't know about that, um, but it was good fun. So yeah, it was um, a, a quick a day, it was a quiz show. Uh, we had a host called Katrina Shearer, uh, three pairs of contestants, and apparently the longest quiz show table in TV history in the UK. Apparently, uh, and they basically were in this. They had a trough down the middle that they used to push down. They had to pick um, balls out and answer questions. That's it, basically. Yeah. Amazing. And just quickly, how did you get that role? Networking. I went to, I, you'll learn, I'm sure you all know, it's these industries, the creative industries are literally about who you know. So I went to BBC network events, Channel 4 networking events. Um, I send out my CV. I send out little clips of what I've done. I approach people when I hear that it might be a job. 
um, yeah, uh, same like with 24 Hours in A&E. I mean, I got very lucky on Big Brother. They, they, a lot of directors were leaving to go and do Love Islands. So they were looking for new directors. And so they put the call out and I, I got, and, well, actually someone told me about it and um, I sent my CV and I was one of five people that they were training up. Wow. The other four had all done single camera directing before. That was my first directing job. I'd never done anything. So I don't even know how to this day I got it, but I got it and thank the gods of TV for it. <laughs> <laughs>